Welcome back to One on One, you dirty dogs, the most in-depth football show on YouTube. On today's episode, we're going to do something a little different. I've wanted to do a mini-series for a little while now within the realms of One on One. And the theme is football's forgotten heroes. It's all about resurfacing players who have made important contributions to the game but have been buried by the sands of time. And as October is Black History Month in the UK, I thought I'd tie it in with our first episode. So, without further ado, I give you our forgotten hero number one, Gilbert St. Elmo Heron, otherwise known as Gil Heron. Heron was the first black footballer to play in a professional capacity in not one, but two countries. Firstly in the United States, and then secondly in Scotland with Glasgow giant Celtic. During his time in Scotland, the Jamaican gained cult status and was dubbed the Black Arrow by fans and the media alike. Of course, now we wouldn't express our affection for a player by honing in on his skin colour, but this was the early 1950s. He played for the club at a time when black and overseas players were largely seen as a novelty rather than part of the norm. And in this series, it would be unconstructive to shy away from those uncomfortable truths. Just like Heron didn't shy away from the limelight after his ship docked in Southampton in 1951. The 29-year-old would score on his debut in front of 40,000 raucous fans and was quickly referred to as Scottish football's golden boy. So after such a heroic start, why was his time with the club so short? Well, before we go any further, let's take a quick trip back in time. Heron was born in Kingston, Jamaica, before relocating to Canada at a young age. Despite excelling as a schoolboy, it's believed that his football prowess was first spotted while he was serving for the Royal Canadian Air Force. Indeed, after World War II, he moved to the USA and joined the Detroit Wolverines, one of the founding members of the North American Professional Soccer League. Catchy title. The Wolverines were crowned the inaugural league champions in 1946, largely thanks to Heron's 29-goal haul. However, despite these heroics, he was still paid far less than his white counterparts, earning just $25 a game. Heron powered through this discrimination, and two years later was playing for the US All-Star team. This prompted Ebony Magazine to say the ancient game of soccer boasts a new world star. It's rumoured that a Celtic scout heard of these exploits when the Hoops were doing one of their lengthy transatlantic tours, prompting the club to offer him a trial. Heron played in an exhibition match that saw the Celtic squad divided in two, one team playing in white, one team playing in green. Celtic had won the Scottish Cup the season before, so had a pretty decent squad. But this didn't stop Heron. He scored two goals, prompting Celtic chairman Robert Kelly to offer him a one-year contract. Gil's son, the famous hip-hop poet Gil Scott Heron, would later describe the contract offer that his father received from Celtic as something that had been beyond the reach and outside the dreams of blacks. In the States, black professionals had mostly played in segregated leagues until baseball great Jackie Robinson broke the colour line in 1947. Heron was now blazing the same trail for aspiring young African-American soccer players. This is a seminal moment that deserves its place in football folklore. Like I mentioned prior, Heron got off to a dream start, scoring two goals in his first two appearances. And what made the goals more impressive was the fact that both opposing goalkeepers were Scottish internationals. Safe to say that the Scottish media were gripped. One paper reported, 50,000 supporters hail him as the greatest thing seen at Celtic Park since goalposts. Now, while there was no formal segregation in British sports, only a handful of non-whites had turned out in a professional capacity in football. Plus, Scotland had a relatively small black population in the 19th and the early part of the 20th century. This was all very new to those involved. The media coverage wasn't just confined to Scotland either, with New York's biggest publication, the Amsterdam News, reporting on Heron's debut as well. Had the American masses been more invested in soccer, there's every chance he could have become a national hero. Despite showing early promise, Heron would have his difficulties at Celtic. In some of the articles I dug up, it was claimed that he failed to succeed over the long term because of a lack of physicality. I smell bullshit. He was a welterweight boxing champion in Detroit and scored 15 goals in 15 games for the reserves. So I think it's safe to say that we can categorise those reports as lazy with the journalists peddling racial stereotypes. Stereotypes that would emerge with increasing frequency 
and dog British football until the early 90s. Celtic historian Tom Campbell also believed that some of the players in the squad didn't like Heron taking the limelight. Campbell goes on to say that there were definite cliques in the Celtic dressing room and he sounds out star striker John McPhail as someone that took great umbrage to Heron excelling in his position. However, and somewhat satisfyingly, he also reports that there were several Celtic players that took Heron's side in this little squabble. Apparently, Bobby Collins was so annoyed with the treatment of his new teammate by McPhail that he refused to pass to him all game against third Lanark. In his research, Campbell does stress that there's minimal evidence that any bad blood was racially motivated. The historian highlights the treatment of another striker, Leslie Johnson, to support this, who also received the cold shoulder from McPhail because he too was a striker. Unfortunately for Heron, when he did get the chance to lead the line in a league game, it didn't go according to plan. It was also pretty unlucky for Heron that at this point, Celtic were faring really poorly in the league. They eventually finished ninth. Heron also got on the wrong side of the chairman Robert Kelly by getting sent off for fighting in a reserve team game against Sterling Albion. Apparently the chairman was a disciplinarian who offloaded several players who invited any bad press. While Heron wasn't recalled to the first team again after this incident, he was the headline act in a series of Caribbean All-Star Games in February 1952, playing in front of a combined audience of 70,000 and scoring four times in three games. Heron stayed in the Scottish First Division with Third Lanark before moving on to Midlands side Kidderminster Harriers, all before returning to the US with the Detroit Corinthians in 1954. And he might not have picked up any titles in his time in Scottish football, but he did find himself a wife who he'd go on to have three children with after moving back to the States with her. They do say that timing is everything in football, and when Heron returned to the States, soccer's popularity began to wane, and as a result, his star also began to fade. In footballing terms, the trail ends with Heron becoming a referee from 1956 till 1968. Upon his death in 2008, his older brother Roy Heron described him as a brilliant person who show people of colour what they can achieve. A black player would not feature in the Scottish top flight until Mark Walters lined up for Rangers against Celtic in 1988. However, in this interim period, the legacy of Gil Heron's one year at Celtic lived on in weird and wonderful ways. It became a feature of his son's UK concerts that people would turn up wearing Celtic jerseys. In later life, Heron published a series of poems, one about his time at Celtic, called The Great Ones. And although his time at the club was short, I think we can agree that the precedent and example that he set definitely puts him in that category. That's all from One on One this week. If you've got a forgotten football hero for me, then hit me up in the comments. I would love to hear your suggestions. Like this video as it really does help with the algorithm. Subscribe to the channel with notifications on and I'll catch you next time.